and gentlemen, I can't believe it. Uh, I'm in a third world country, the Czech Republic. The internet barely works, so we couldn't get this working. But I have the absolute legend of gambling, the host, the pro player, the millionaire, uh, the very entertaining personality on social media when he's not banned. Hey, Blyman, hey, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, thank you, Mr. Lemon. Right, so... Um, we did this because you randomly came on. Oh, how about uh, Lyman on Lemon? But in the meantime, Lyman, you managed to get yourself banned oh, on 2 plus 2 for the 7th. Lyman, thank you so much for coming oh, on. Oh, shit, I got muted. Oh, yeah, yeah. For coming on. Hey, I'll see you now. And you have your, you have your stream on, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay, Take everything's care. perfect. We're good, we're good. Yeah, so... Uh, Guys, in the chat, is the is the sound okay? Can you hear us properly? Are the levels the same? Right, so Lyman, um, seventh time banned plus two. How did that happen again? How did I get banned all the times on two plus two? Yeah. Well, basically, you know, um, the moderators at, at two plus two, they're... Uh, uh, you know, how does, what's a nice way to say it? Like, they're like, um, fucking losers and they're like life failures. And, uh, they have their idea of the way the world works. And if you don't subscribe to that, then, uh, they ban you because it's the only like little tiny bit of power that they have in their pitiful lives. Uh, but then I always end up getting unbanned because I create great content. And if I do a thread or something, it'll get hundreds of thousands of views. So, you know, the people who run these sites, they know that I'm going to give them lots of free, great content. So, um, that overpowers the mods for a little while. Uh, it always usually comes to a head at some point, though. Right now, my forum at 2 plus 2 is being moderated by a, a bot, not by a human. So, mostly the mods are staying out of it. There was, like... The bot's horrible, by the way, because they have it set so sensitive... That if you even say, like, the word dildo or something, it it deletes your posts. So there was this one mod. I can't remember his name right now. I think it's Mad Lex. He came on there and said, oh, you can't whine about the bot. You're such, a, you're such an asshole that uh, nobody will moderate your forum. Because they basically created a forum just for me. Um, and they stuck me in there, sort of like a dungeon. You're such an asshole, no one will moderate your forum, so you can't complain about the bot. So then I just instantly challenged him a $100,000 bet that there were lots of people that want to moderate my forum, including current moderators there. And he shut the fuck up, like, instantly, because he knew that he was full of shit. It's like, if you didn't act like a child, then you could have a moderator. It's like, no, I could have a moderator anyway, just not you, you idiot. I can have a real moderator <laughs> who understood that when you're, that, that if you want to have good content, you have to understand who's providing the good content and give them a little leeway. You can't just, you know, no, no one cares what the what moderators have to say. No one gives a fuck what moderators have to say. They, like nobody ever. There's never been a fucking thread with a with half a million views on any fucking thing. Like I'm a moderator. Ask me anything. No one gives a fuck. So, uh, so me and the moderators have never quite got along, and but me and the the owners are almost always get along. Who, do you know? Um, we, we will go into Red Dot Gambling Poker and your origins. Uh, the ownership of Two Plus Two changed from Mason to Hand to Note, right? I think. Uh, yes. That's right. Yeah. So, and at one point you get banned. And by the way, guys, um, if you if you don't know Lyman. 
he is an absolute legend of 2 plus 2. I think your number one post was 2000 random shit. You know, you gave advice to people that people were really start for. You have over a million views across your couple threads only. Uh, right. That, that people go into, you know. And you got banned seven times. And now uh, times seem to have changed. You were banned for only a month. Suddenly you reappear and you reappear with your own section, with your own dungeon. Right. So if you go to two plus two guys, ask me anything. That's Lyman section, right? I think yeah. Grimstar came in there, tried to like piggyback uh, on, on your success. It was pretty much a failure. You know, he doesn't get the piece you get. Uh, well, this guy in the chat, James Grimaldi, that's Grimstar. Oh, this Grimstar. Yeah, Grimstar he's is a, awesome. <laughs> he's an interesting character in his own right. Yeah. So whatever. Absolutely. Absolute I wish him only, I wish I wish him only the best. So, um, uh, Lyman, you were reinstated. Why do you think? Why do you think? You know, Grimstar. <laughs> he, he's obviously a legend of gambling as well. But um, you get so many views. You get so many questions. But you also seem to have your posse of people who try who are trying to cancel you on all these right. platforms. What is it about you that attracts so much attention? Well. There's like um, a train of thought uh, online, and that train of thought is when it, when trolls come, you know, or whatever you want to call them, trolls, haters, whatever you want to call these people, these like ass licking scum, these maggots. When they come, you're just supposed to ignore them. You're supposed to be bigger than them. You're supposed to be like, hold yourself to a higher standard or something. Um, you're not supposed to feed the trolls, quote unquote. But because people do that, it's that's created the problems that we have in society today, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. What you really should do is attack them mercilessly and... Um, violently and you should degrade and demean them and crush them uh embarrass them shame them and destroy them that's what you really should do because just ignoring them doesn't work they just stick around and stick around and stick around but once you start just like crushing them to the destroying them what they do instead then is they start trying to go around you and get you in trouble because they know that they, that they, they've been owned, they've been destroyed. They've been owned. What the site administrators problem is, is when they get a bunch of complaints from these people, they actually take the complaint serious. Cause here's how an internet troll complains. They don't like when I tell an internet, internet troll, like if an internet troll says something stupid, I challenge them a hundred thousand dollar bet. Then they don't take the bet, and I say, I'm literally shitting down your throat, you fucking piece of shit. You are literally gargling shit coming out of my ass and directly down your throat. Like, I'm just going to fucking dis destroy this person. Then that person, because they, they wouldn't take the $100,000 bet, and then they got destroyed, they, they, like, they do feel shame, okay? But what they do is, because they are like the lowest form of subhuman life, they then go to the site administrator and say, this person is harassing me. This is what always happens to me. Then they always, they say, look at what he said to me. He said he was going to shit down my eager, narrow throat. He's harassing me. I've never harassed anyone in my entire fucking life. They come to my threat. This is where the site administrators make a big mistake and they don't understand something. If I have a thread or if I have a, a Twitter page and you come to my page, you're in my house. I get to do with you as I please. You are my slave. You're my bitch. You're my cunt. I fucking own you. I don't come to any of these people's pages ever. I don't come on their podcasts. They don't have them. I don't go to their Twitter account. I don't even know if they have fucking... I don't fucking go. I don't go to their AMA. I don't know any, who any of these idiots are. They follow me. I do not follow them. So when the site administrator sees them say, this guy's harassing me, the site administrator should immediately say, 
then just fucking leave, you bitch. But they never say that. They always take their, her, they always, then they, they ban me. And then I get something saying like, you have been banned for targeted harassment. How can I target somebody who I don't know? How can I target somebody who is on my page? This is like saying that if somebody fucking breaks into my house and I shoot them, that I was targeting them. No, I'm not targeting them. I don't know who they are. I don't give a fuck about these people. So I tr what I'm trying to teach through the way that I behave in these forums is the, I'm trying to model proper behavior. The reason why we've got fucking Nazis and scumbags running around the fucking streets who is because everybody allows them to come and be where they want and speak the way they want in other people's areas. If somebody comes in your area, you should immediately just try to stomp them out. You can't just like, you can't just ignore these people. It doesn't do any good. I've tried ignoring them. It doesn't stop them. It does not slow them down. You have to just like smash them. It has to be like just Hulk smash, Hulk smash, Hulk smash. But then once you Hulk smash them, and it's very easy to do because they are like, you know, they're mental midgets. They're, they're losers. They challenging them to, to, to large wagers is the best way to like, basically like put them in a box very quickly. Then, the, but then the site administrators at Twitter, two plus two, at all the other places I've been thrown off of, um, uh, Facebook. <laughs> Gab, you have you have kicked out of Gab. Gab, <laughs> yeah, and Gab is like just for Nazis. I got kicked out of there. All these site administrators, then they need to say like they need to go back and like I got kicked off of Reddit several times. Um, lifetime ban from Reddit. Like the the site administrator needs to say like to the person that's reporting me they need to say to them why are you reporting this guy you're on his page if you don't want this if you don't want this smoke if you don't want to feel this heat just get the fuck off his page that but they but it's like an, it is it, 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 it's an admission of defeat it just crushes them so that's the main problem is is like i don't just like i'm not just gonna roll over and pretend these people don't exist when they come at me, I'm going to come at them like tenfold. And everybody who thinks from fucking the president of the United States all the way down to me, anyone who ever has thought that these trolls just disappear, they never disappear. You have to take them head on. If you don't take the people fucking head on, it's, it's viewed as weakness and it just allows them to build more and more and more uh interconnections because they don't have they don't have any fear or shame but when you attack them with great prejudice and uh and and eagerness and zeal they feel shame and it breaks their connections down and they start to disappear that's why like you see in my AMA now where the mods know where, where I, I crush all those people. I crush them. You notice they've started to disappear. They've given up. They can't, they know that the, 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 the two plus two just keeps bringing me back, bringing me back, bringing, bringing me back. They no longer can just go back, go to the owner and say like, oh, you know, Lyman harassed me because I went to his thread and he yelled at me. That's not harassment. Harassment is me going to their thread and yelling at them. But once they see that the, the site administrator is not going to back them up, they just start to disappear. And now there's almost none of those people anymore. Almost all of them have dropped away. Every now and then one pops up and they just get smashed down again immediately. Just like that Mad Lex mod. I just challenge them 100k bet, just try to smash them. Yeah, uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, this... I know challenging two bets was the, you got yourself banned from Gab because you challenged the guy that you were you, you were posting against to, to a bet. Uh, this got you banned basically everywhere but two plus two right now, you know. But do you actually think that part of your popularity? I know when you were on Twitter, you said you got uh, almost a million impressions almost right away. Do you think part of your right. popularity is because you say how it is 
and you're not afraid to go after these people. Yeah, because there's so many people that say, like, I wish I could do that. Like, so many people, they say, oh, I wish I could do what you do, but I have a job or I have people in my life that are not going to like that. And so, like, in some ways, I'm just, like, the hero of the stupid or whatever. <laughs> um, like, I don't give a fuck. No, I don't answer to nobody. Um, I, don't, I have, like, F you money. Um, I'm retired. If I'm, uh, like, I'm the guy who has to do it. Like, I just have to be that guy because other people can't be that guy. Uh, they have responsibilities or something like I have no responsibilities. So I know a lot of people uh, basically are just like, I'm like, I'm like the avatar. Like I'm the guy who like does to the trolls what they wish that they could do, but they can't really say the things I say. They can't just say like, I fuck your mom. And then the person says, my mom's dead. And then I say, I know she died from a 24 hour extended squirting orgasm that I gave her. Like most people can't say that there's going to be repercussions in their life. But for me, there's no repercussions The people can literally go fuck themselves. Um, I'm a winning professional poker player for decades. There's nothing you can do to me. You can't stop me from winning. So I just have to be that guy. It's, it's my plight. Yeah, so, uh, right, so obviously people want to live through you. They want to see how it is to actually fight back. And it's, it's true, like, most of us can't do this, you know? But, I mean, if we if you have a YouTube channel and you're somewhere else, you depend on, on your livelihood, we don't have that six million net worth fuck you money from, you know, being successful all these years, you know? It's it's true. So I guess it makes sense why you have so many views. So let's go back, by the way. 2 plus 2, obviously, a legendary forum. You started on something called rec.gambling.poker. You took yeah. over your brother, right? Can you talk about like the Wild West? But obviously today we have freaking AI moderating sections on 2 plus 2, you know, it's owned by uh, hand to know the, the AI HUD and whatnot. Uh, how were the old days of rec.gambling on, on po uh, rec poker? And can you tell us the difference between 2 plus 2 then and how it is now? Well, yeah, I mean, back then it was like, I guess a public message board. Um, I don't even, I didn't even barely know, remember how the internet worked so fucking long ago. Um, and um, people, it was just like hobbyist. There was no such thing as professional poker players uh, back then for the most part. Everybody was just a hobbyist. Like professional poker players were sort of like, sort of like, we're like Doyle Brunson or something like half cowboy, half criminal. Um, you know, they were like Maverick or something. There's something from television. Something from like a TV show would be what you think of as a professional poker player. Uh, the idea of being like a young guy, like going to the casino and grinding out an hourly is completely unheard of. Or having poker as a job was completely unheard of. So... Um, you know, you couldn't, like, go and tell your mom, like, oh, I'm not going to college. I'm going to be a professional poker player. Or I, I graduated with my degree in accounting or something, but I'm going to be a professional poker player. This shit didn't exist. Like, everyone just basically would think you're, like, a semi-criminal. Um, there was there was no, like, veneer of professionalism or there was nobody you could point to who had done it. Anybody you pointed to also seemed like a cowboy or a criminal. So the way that message boards were back then for poker were probably the same that message boards are now for like, um, uh, I, I don't like, uh, arts and crafts or something, or the say or message boards for like some video game or something, you know, like it's a bunch of people like saying like, Oh, how, how do you get past level three? You know? Oh, I, I don't know. I think this is what I would do to get past level three. Um, it wasn't like, I, I, mean, I don't even know how video game, I, I don't even, that's probably a bad example because people on video games probably, but I mean, or like uh, a message board for like how to grow tomatoes or something. It was probably like a message board for how to grow bigger tomatoes. Like which, which, um, which fertilizer do you use? Uh, how, you know, uh, 
how blah 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 and like so it was, it was just like a bunch of dorks basically like poker dorks uh, serious hobbyists um talking about stuff and there was no no limit hold'em no limit hold'em did not exist um no there was no such thing as no limit hold'em in a casino until 2003 2004 so like we're talking about limit hold'em we're talking about stud we're talking about like low ball like uh how often do you snow after the draw like how often do you do, if you have trips, do you like keep a fourth card and draw one so that the, you, to, to try to represent that you just have a, that you're drawing to a four flush or a four straight and then try to snow after the draw, blah, blah, blah. You are on some instead, like, uh, when you're on, when, when, when on third street, uh, how many clubs need to be out behind you before you won't play a three clubs in your hand? Something like this. We're not even talking. And nobody's going like, I ran a simulation of, Eight, uh, you know, I, I went to the fucking pro, pro poker tools, or I, <laughs> I went to fucking pie out solver, and I can't believe you're even asking this question because if I was on pie out solver, if you had, if you were using the right software, you would already know the answer to this. Like nobody knew the answer to anything. Nobody, no one knew one fucking answer. We all were all just trying to like like basically stumble through the dark. Uh, so. If people were to go back and read that shit, they would just be like, oh, my God, what the fuck? How did these people, you know, ever make money playing cards? But the truth is, it's just like everything else in the land of the blind. The one eyed man is king. So, like, I didn't need to be smarter than everybody. I just need to be smarter than the other people at the table. So these hobbyists, right? So I, I know in the party poker era, by the way, if you, if you had a younger guys, party poker era, as you said, you know, you, you do one eye with, uh, with the blind and you had 10 big blinds per hundred win, win rate, I know, five PTBV. Uh, so you, ha you have these hobbyists, you know, and uh, how did you get on 2 plus 2, you know? Who are actually the people, was it Mason that started it, you know? Uh, and uh, how is it now? How would you describe the state of 2 plus 2 in 2024? Well, um, I, yeah, I, guess, I suppose two plus two was started by Mason Malmuth and David Sklansky. They were at the time writing the very best poker books that money could buy. It was, a, it was the very best poker information you could possibly get was through their poker books. Um, you know, a lot of people that were writing, uh, sort of best-selling poker books back then were really horrible poker players, big losers. But Sklansky and Malmuth were winning players, and they were grinders, and they were people that you could go to the casino and see playing in Las Vegas and Los Angeles for a while. Um, you know, uh, so when they started i was on two plus two before my red my registration date on two plus two is 2002 but i was on two plus two before 2002 um before then you didn't have to register you could just lurk uh and uh you know there, people on two plus two like when it transitioned from rec dot gambling dot poker over to two plus two it got a little the talk got a little bit more serious i suppose but it was still like very, very rudimentary, very rudimentary. Like if you went on there and posted about no limit hold'em, everybody, the biggest game that anyone would be posted about would be like $1, $2, because that's all that existed. So there was, it was like very, it was like the, the basically the infancy of no limit hold'em talk. And most of the talk was still about limit hold'em. I would say limit hold'em was the majority of posting back then. And, and Sklansky and Malmuth are, very good limit hold'em players, very tight, very tight, insanely tight limit hold'em players. And Sklansky sort of like at the beginning of No Limit Hold'em was like, why would anyone play this game? This game doesn't make any sense. I don't understand why anyone would play a game where the the blinds, let's say one dollar, two dollar, and the buy-in's two hundred, and most people have stacks over two hundred. Or the you could e just easily say the blinds are ten twenty, and everyone's stack is over two thousand. All the same thing for this for what he was saying was, if the blinds are so tiny compared to the average pot size and the stack sizes, 
Why would anyone ever play a hand? There's no reason not to just sit and wait for like aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens, ace, king, and ace, queen suited. There's literally no reason to play any other hand but those hands uh, because you can't get blinded away. The blinds don't mean anything. Because you got to remember, we're coming from games at that time like stud with a bring in and an ante or limit hold'em where the blinds are very, very big compared to average pot size where you, you fighting for the blinds is very important. Uh, or in stud where you could literally just get anteed off a table. So then this no limit hold'em thing pops up and there's n no reason to play a hand. You cannot get anteed off the table. The blinds are microscopic compared to average pot size. So that's when Sklansky came up with like sort of this like brilliant concept idea called invisible antes. And he's like, basically like the only reason to play the game is because there are invisible antes in the game. And the invisible antes basically just describe the amount of money that you can expect bad players to put in for no good reason. Now there was a, an example of this was like, if there were no blinds whatsoever, let's say there was no blinds whatsoever. The small blind was zero. The big blind was zero. Bad players would still play. They would still bring in. <laughs> like what would it like if you if your bad player got his favorite hand, you know, fucking eight nine suited, he would still bring in. Like what the fuck? Why why would anyone bring in? So like it, it, it's like no limit hold them. And he was, Sklansky was 100% right. There's no reason for No Limit Hold'em to exist. But what happened is, is it caught on like wildfire. It became a very popular game. But the, the actual structure of the game is horrible because the structure of the game with the blinds being so tiny the average and the average pot size and stack size being much bigger as a, per, as a per portion of how many blinds are in there and the preflop hand strengths running so far apart because the preflop hand strengths run so far apart where you can wait for hands that are always going to be a four to one or a five to one favorite over your opponent's range, three to one favorite over your opponent's range. There's no reason to wait to fucking play hands. Then think about a hand, like think about a game like Omaha, Parliament Omaha. You would say to yourself, well, isn't the same thing true for Pot Limit Omaha? It's not true for Pot Limit Omaha. And here's the reason why. The, uh, all the, the reason I'm saying all this is just to like help people wrap their brain around how stupid No Limit Hold'em is. And even though I made a lot of money on it, I'll tell you the reason why No Limit Hold'em is structured the way it is, too. So I'll tell you some stuff that people probably don't know. Um, and, and if you're playing No Limit Hold'em, you can sit and wait for a hand. Okay, because aces is a hand, kings is a hand, queens is a hand. You can sit and wait for a hand. You cannot lose money playing these hands. It's impossible. I can prove this to you. If I were to go to any table in a casino, any table, and I would say to this table, I, I get 50% of the action on aces, kings, queens, and jacks. I, you could even add in tens and ace, king if you want. Um, but although those are marginal. I get 50% of the action on all these hands. I don't care how you play them. You can play them any way you want. I'll come back in five hours and I'll pick up however much money I've won or I'll pay however how much money I've lost. You will never, fucking never come back and owe money. Yeah. Ever. No matter how bad the players are. No matter what, you cannot lose money in this situation because when you get dealt those hands, you cannot play them in a way bad enough to lose money in a, in, in a modern 100 big blind poker game. Now, if the game was a 1,000 big blinds deep or something, I might not do that because once it gets super, super deep, a lot of play gets into the game because it, it, it's, it's a bad player can just like absolutely murder some of these hands. But in the normal 100 big blind, 150 big blind, 200 big blind poker game, you cannot lose with these hands over, a, over any decent sized sample. But in Omaha, now think about Omaha. 
I could, I absolutely could not walk up to any table and say, anyone who gets dealt aces, kings, queens, jacks, I take 50% of your action and make money. Because in Omaha, those are the hands that amateurs lose, get destroyed by. Because they think that they're getting dealt a hand, but they're not getting dealt a hand. They're just getting dealt a draw. Okay? So they play them horribly post-flop because they're getting wedded to these over-pair type hands that when any significant money goes in, they're always losing. Whereas in Hold'em, if you have an over-pair and significant money goes in, you're usually winning. So this is why in Hold'em, you can just sit, you can have this rote, horrible rote strategy of sitting and waiting for hands because the blinds don't force you to play. But in Omaha, you can't sit and wait for hands because there's nothing to wait for. You never get dealt a hand. You only get dealt stronger and weaker draws. Wow, Everything I have, a, I, have a, I have a question though. So uh, if, if Honda was such a shit game, you know, obviously on two plus two, you started with it and people were excited, you know, nothing nothing out there, Holden was there. Why has Hold'em kept being the, the most popular game? I know you mix your time, you play mostly PLO, you play some Hold'em, whatever, whatever the recreationals are. Why did 2 plus 2 in the poker world, why did it stick with Hold'em? How come these other games that are arguably better, how come they didn't take over though? What the fuck? Oh, Hold'em is deceptively simple game. And because it's a deceptively simple game, uh, it's very easy to teach people to play. And they can feel like they know what's going on very quickly. Whereas... Games, another deceptively simple game would be like uh, five card draw. But five card draw, there was never any, there was never a poker boom of five card draw. Uh, stud is a complicated game, no matter how you cut it, um, because of the out cards and remembering the out cards and the fact that position is constantly changing and yada, yada, yada. Stud is, a, is, is, is like, 20x as complicated as Hold'em if you really are playing it correctly. Uh, but even if you're playing it incorrectly, it's still it's just complicated to the average person. Um, the reason that Hold'em persists amongst professional poker players is because Hold'em is the quickest way to take people's money. It's, it's much easier to take somebody's money in No Limit Hold'em than it is in any other form of poker. poker. And No Limit Hold'em has very low variance compared to other forms of poker. So the variance in stud or limit hold'em or Omaha is much, much, much higher than the variance in no limit hold'em. And the reason why the variance in no limit hold'em is low is because the preflop hand strengths run so far apart. And that's the reason. And so the fault of the game that the preflop hand strengths run so far apart and the blinds are so tiny is actually the best thing about the game if you're a professional poker player. Because if you're a professional poker player, you basically invented a game where patient people take money from impatient people. And nothing is going to stop that flow of money. The patient person who waits for the good hands and plays them with a raise and plays them in position is always going to take the money from the impatient person who plays too many hands, doesn't wait for, for position, and just tries to see flops. This is why... When you get like a super baller crusher poker pros who want to like use all of their skills and be involved and they're very laggy, they want to play like heads up or shorthanded poker. They want to play heads up or shorthanded no limit hold them. Because if, if, if you try to, it doesn't matter how good you are at poker. If, if there's seven people just sitting there waiting for the top 10 hands, and then there's you and another guy playing street poker. Say it's a nine-handed table. Doug Polk is at the nine-handed table, and some other guy, some other street poker guy, is at the nine-handed table. Let's say um, uh, uh, some Euro fucking. I don't know anybody. <laughs> right, okay, yeah, well, one of the one of one of us Euros here. Victor Blum, okay, and Vic, and they've decided they're going to play street poker. You know, what? like they're going to fucking get, get in the streets. They're going to fucking raise in three-bet light, four-bet light, blah, blah, blah. You can do that heads up. You can do that maybe in a three-handed game or four-handed game. 
and make money. But if you try to do that in a full ring game, you're just going to get destroyed because you and this guy are playing street poker, but the other seven players are just going to pick you off, pick you off, pick you off, pick you off. You're going to keep getting picked off and picked off and picked off by real hands. So you can't play street poker in a full ring game. A full ring game, the only way that you can fucking play and make money is like leather ass. And that's why, like, when you see, like, the V-Pips, an online full ring, V-Pips are fucking microscopic. There's no way to escape it. There's just no way to escape it. The game makes, the game is is structured very poorly if everybody has even the tiniest clue how to play. Because you, if you have a tiny clue how to play in Parliament Omaha, you're still going to get destroyed. You have to really know what you're doing because you can't wait to get dealt a hand you're always just going to get dealt a draw. So the reason that No Limit Hold'em sort of started the way it did, No Limit Hold'em is not a derivative of draw. No Limit Hold'em is a derivative of stud. So the way that stud works is you can only, seven card stud works is you can only have so many people at the table uh, and if there's too many people at the table, you're going to deal all the cards out. And if you deal all the cards out, then you have to have, you can no longer give people each their individual card at the end. What you have to do is you have to have community cards at the end instead. If there's too many players. So if, so you think like if there's seven stud players and each player gets seven cards with burns, there's they're they're going to run out of cards. If there's eight stud players going to run out of cards. So, if, if, if you were running a private poker game and eight or nine people showed up and you try to play stud, so which is what everybody played back then, somebody would have to walk or sit out. And even when you had it at seven or eight players, sometimes you'd still run out of cards and you'd have to deal community cards at the end. And what the, these game hosts figured out was you could cram more people on the table just by dealing community cards, mm-hmm. not by dealing everybody their own individual cards. So, so what happens is Hold'em becomes a derivative of stud, and the very smart players, the professional poker players, realize very quickly that Hold'em is a much better game for a professional poker player than stud is. Because stud, with the antes and the fact that you have an extra street, so stud you have... 3rd Street, 4th Street, 5th Street, 6th Street, 7th Street. Six streets. Hold them, you just have pre-flop, flop, turn river. Five streets. So because Hold them has less streets and shared cards, it's a much lower variance game. Also, when you are ahead of somebody and hold them, because you're sharing cards, you're way ahead of them. Because you're sharing cards, once you're ahead of somebody, They're sort of buried. They're buried underneath you because they, to get better, when their hand gets better, your hand gets better too, okay? So what the professional rounders, the Texas sort of uh, rounders figured out was to take money from fish, hold them was much, much better game than stud, much better. And hold them was a derivative of stud that gained popularity because The hosts wanted to spread it. And the reason the hosts wanted to spread it, they could seat more people at the table. Okay. People didn't have to walk or sit out. And the professional poker players liked it because the strategy to take the money was very simple. Just wait, wait and be aggressive, wait and be aggressive, wait and be aggressive. That's it. Yeah, uh, Grimstar says it's true, you know, when uh, you, 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 you only have to pay to see flop. People will start playing nine for the offsuit. I guess there's always going to be case, the case with recreationalists, right? They won't actually uh, take their time to learn the game. And even, even if they do, they just play whatever the fuck hands they want, you know. Uh, yeah, dongs don't understand concept of playing four cards. Yeah, that, that's true, you know. Yeah, so obviously, uh, I, I, I see now, so the host needed it because you can see more people at the table, the pros like it, simple for the beginners. And uh, one big way how people know you actually is from Hold'em, you know. I, I think yeah, a lot of people were surprised you said you play mostly PLO now. And where they know you from is Life at the Bike. 
So, Lyman, right. um, can you uh, reminisce a little bit uh, about life at the bike? That's my first question. And second is, how does life at the bike compare to the modern streams and modern life at the bike? Can you talk a little bit, a little bit about that? Well, when I was at Live at the Bike, when I was an owner of Live at the Bike, it was, I think it was basically the only stream. Um, uh, nobody had really thought about making money off of a stream through the number of views that you got. Uh, you made money off of a stream from the casino paying you. Um, the casino paid you because people would come in to play on the stream and because people would come in to play while the stream was going. So, uh, a poker stream, um, not a poker, a poker table rakes a lot. Most people don't have any clue how much one poker table rakes. If you're, if you're at a poker table that goes 24 seven, and it rakes seven dollars a hand. You're gonna rake like one point two million dollars a year, like just at this tiny rake of seven dollars a hand. Uh, so, like, you could be spreading a five ten no limit game that gets straddled sometimes with average stacks of over a thousand dollars. You're gonna rake one point two five million a year. Uh, no one would ever guess that in a million years. Um, so if you run a stream and that stream's running a certain number of hours a day and uh, when the stream shuts off, the game still keeps on running and the people who couldn't get on the stream are sitting in a feeder game and that game keeps running, you might start raking, you know, a mountain of money per year. It won't quite be the million because it isn't going to go 24-7 but it might be many hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the casino will give you basically a cut of that. Um, it might be a flat fee or it might be a direct cut. So the casino might make a deal with you where they give you 40% of the rake that comes in on your tables. So uh, if you rake a half a million dollars a year, you know, now you have $200,000. The casino's giving you $200,000 to run the show. Um, if then what we would do is we would sell a subscription service. So the way our show worked then was no one, we, we didn't care about views. Views didn't mean anything to us. Like it wasn't the way it is now. People would come and play on the show. These were almost all people from Los Angeles uh, some people would come in from around the country or even the world, people who had watched the show. But their main thing that they wanted to, to get out of it was they wanted to see themselves on the show. And they wanted to hear the commentary. So to you could watch it live for free, but if you wanted to watch it later, you had to buy a subscription. And the su subscription was $19 a month. And we had, you know, a thousand people with subscriptions. So we would get the the $200,000 from the casino and the $20,000 a month from the subscriptions. So that's how we were making money on the show. Um, I didn't care at all about famous poker players at all. I didn't care about views. If a famous poker player wanted to play on the show, you know, like if, I don't know, Tom Dwan or Doug Polk or somebody called me up and said they wanted to be on the show, I would just say, get on the board. I, I, I didn't even deal with that because... The other owners didn't want me to be near it, but they, we basically all had the same philosophy. We just, when we put the shows together, there was no, like, there was no thing like with, with this guy, um, what's his name? Um, the Jack four guy, uh, Garrett Alstein. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was no thing where like a professional poker player told us what the lineup was going to be. There was no thing where a professional poker player would have a, any sort of veto power over who played on the show. Mm -hmm. The way that we ran the show was we had a public board that you signed up for. And the first nine people to sign up were in the game. That's it. But we didn't give a fuck who they were. I didn't give two shits who the first people who nine, nine people who showed up was. Um, 
And when one of them went broke, the next person on the list got in the game. I didn't play any politics. There was no politics with me. Um, and then I or somebody else would do commentary over the game. And then the people pay a subscription to watch themselves on the game. And the casino would give us money to collect rake on the game. That's how it used to run. Then uh, we we brought on this this kid, uh, Ryan Feldman. And Feldman had a completely different idea for how poker shows are supposed to run. Uh, and I'm not, and, and, and he, he saw the future of how it was going to run. He wanted to have big stars, poker stars, and get tons of views and monetize the views through YouTube, I suppose, or other nefarious gambling operations. <laughs> Um, Twitch. Uh, so he got this guy, Doug Polk, and then he said, Abe, we have to have this guy on the show. He's a really big deal. Okay. I said, okay, I don't give a shit. Um, but, uh, he has to come on poker sesh. He can't just come on the show. He has to come on poker sesh, which was the podcast for the show. And then they were like, why does he have to come on poker sesh? I said, because it's disrespectful to all the people who pay the subscription to just p jump this guy to the head of the list and not have him show some respect to the channel. So that ended up, ended up becoming a disaster. I don't know if I want to get into it, but... <laughs> um, it ended up becoming a big falling out between me and Feldman. And I, it was, it, and it was, it was not tenable for us both to be part of the show anymore. Uh, he had an owner, he had bought in an ownership stake too. Um, so we came to an agreement where I got paid a certain amount of money and I got paid a certain amount of money to, for a non-compete and I got paid a certain amount of money for my shares. And I just went my separate way. I just went my separate way. I, I was 100% happy with that, by the way. Like 110% happy. <laughs> right. Because, because the, the way it was moving, if I was going to have to be nice to professional poker players, it's just impossible for me. It's literally impossible for me to be nice to a professional poker player. Um, I have no respect for professional poker player uh i respect people a person but for how they behave as a as an individual human but the idea that somebody is like a professional poker player i just find like laughable really laughable <laughs> because every two weeks there's new professional poker player you know over the 26 years i've been coming to the casino there's been thousands of crushers crushers and the number of them that are have, that have lasted from when i started to where i'm in is like not even maybe one hand maybe not even one hand so to tell me like oh you got to be nice to this like this crusher this new professional poker crusher it is laughable to me it's like oh come on <laughs> this new professional poker crusher is he a nice guy is he gonna be nice to me i'll be nice to him but i'm not gonna pretend i give a fuck about whatever about him being a professional poker crush right. doesn't mean shit so so basically so it was related but um uh, you know in retrospect by the way I, I i took a look into this your rant is legendary obviously the doc was you know, big timing you I, I i see that the worlds were basically colliding back then of you you respecting the players you know you showing what actual grind is having those waiting lists and now nowadays when you look at the streams they cater to the uh, to the popular people, you know, they, they put them in, buy them in, they, they do everything they can uh, to basically uh, suck up to them, you know. <laughs> to right. Them in. Uh, yeah, I looked into it. Apparently, Doug Polk did say something. He had to have a, he, he needed to get a haircut. <laughs> That's why he came late, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he, was a, he was like a prima donna, you know, he's a prima donna. And he, I just don't think you can be a prima donna if you play cards for a living. Your life is not that important. Um, 
I don't do, I just don't deal with prima donnas. I don't, I don't deal with it. Like, so it was just the wrong place for me because the way that poker is going is, is going to catering to prima donnas. And like, it ends up like the biggest prima donna in the history of poker is a scared Edelstein guy. Yeah. And they cater to him and cater to him and cater to him and did everything and everything and everything. And it still ends up biting you, you know? Um, but apparently this is what people want to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, apparently this is, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't find these shows interesting at all. I don't find these curated lineups interesting at all. Uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm the, I'm in the, I'm in the minority here. I'm not, I'm not right about this. I'm wrong about this, obviously. So, I mean, I'm not like on a high horse or something. It's just me. I think the interesting thing about a poker game is random people who don't know each other showing up to go at it and true raw human emotion um, uh, in regards to these interactions where the money matters to them, okay? That's what I find interesting about poker is the, 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 the raw emotional interaction between people uh, when they're gambling. I don't find a curated lineup where when something goes wrong, you end up finding out and all the dirt starts to come out. You end up finding out that these two people were swapping. These two people were selling these, this person had three backers. This person got, got a loan the night before the game. Like, I don't know what's, what's interesting about that. I guess maybe like the, like reality TV. I don't watch reality TV either. Right. So maybe, Maybe the reality TV aspect of it, I guess, but like the actual like poker game aspect of it, I don't find interesting at all. Right, let's let's get into this, you know, because obviously you talk a lot about the poker industrial complex and how poker pros are not real actual pros. They're not really rich, you know. Can you talk a little right. bit about, you know, if, if people are watching right now, obviously we will play to the European audience. If someone wants to become a professional poker player, what would you tell them? Um it's it's a waste of time. I mean, I hate to I hate to say this to you, you guys, but it's a massive waste of time. Um, poker games, like most people don't know this because they haven't been around long enough, but poker games right now are the worst that they've ever been, <laughs> and next year they'll be even worse. Uh, poker games. 20 years ago were better than poker games were 10 years ago were better than they were five years ago. Everything just gets worse and the rate just goes up. So if you're going, if you're interest entering the poker world as your job, not as a hobby, as a hobby, poker is great. Poker is still great as a hobby, but if you're trying to enter the poker world as your job, you're entering a shrinking world with a higher cost of doing business every year. The, the your poker world's getting smaller and every year the cost of doing business is getting higher so 10 years ago I didn't fucking know what a euro grinder was the fuck is a fucking euro grinder like now I go into the casino three players at every table are from L Lithuania but fuckistan no no offense <laughs> I, and, and, and because like they're just i don't know could maybe there was money to be made playing in these countries um before and now there isn't money to be made playing there now and they all end up in in, in, in the united states in my games making my games horrible like the poker world is just like there's too many pros and not enough fish number one and the rake just goes up, up, up. So the average size of a poker game today is much smaller than the average size a poker game was 10 years ago. And poker games in 2008 were maybe six times the size that they are now. So I don't, I don't see how it's like a really good career decision. Well, um, hang on, Lyman. Well, what do you tell to the people who tell you, listen, I watched World Poker Tour. I'm watching World Series of Poker. The numbers are through the roof. If you look at right. the online numbers as well, 
when COVID started, like the number of players, you know, right. uh, is actually increasing that do play poker online. You know, so um, on social media, from media, you hear all this excitement about rising popularity. How come you don't think it actually translates? You know, what would you sell, uh, tell those people that think poker is actually experiencing a mini boom right now? Well, the, first of all, the number of people that are playing poker online, that's not really a number of people. It's like a number of tables. You can have more tables with less people because a, a certain number of people are playing five or 10 or 15 tables. Back when I played online table, I, online poker, I would play four to six tables. That was a ton then. That was like in 2004, that was fucking 2005. That was an insane number of tables. Now it's probably what some kid does with one hand. Plus, just because you think you're playing against people, you're not necessarily playing against people. You could be playing against bots or teams of people using real-time assistance. So it's not so much about looking at the number of people logged on to a site. It's looking at the actual stats of the game. If you look at the actual stats of these games, it's basically a certain number of ba of insanely tight, aggressive playing styles grinding down a tiny, tiny, tiny number of people. They're panning for a, just a little tiny bit of gold. And so they have to pan for that gold across many, 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 many tables. You couldn't just, like, used to be able to, it used to be able to go to poker stars. What the hell? <laughs> I saw the N Lyman N-word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, there was a quote there, you know, we'll have to censor it afterwards. Yeah, um, I was looking for a quote, actually, Lyman, and there is, uh, there was a quote from 2017, right after we got banned on the, uh, on 2 plus 2, by the way, and people are saying that the Lyman is the best thing to happen to this site, and poker media in general, Remember the good old days. Fulton, Fulton Pro stealing all your money. Uh, ultimate bet. Endless collusion scandals. No, do we need to go down the list of pros that you rat salivated over that are really, really broke right now? Remember all those internet pros were going to take over live poker after Black Friday? <laughs> Remember how you said any cheating online was impossible? Remember saying you could make 500 hour, uh, per hour at 1020? Remember being a tournament pro, seen Eli, uh, Eli Elizra, Lyman was ahead of the curve on all this stuff, uh, and you asked Burgery Kitties, defended the cheats, liars, and scum until your last breath. But hey, don't listen. <laughs> Keep looking up to Doug Polk and uh, paying for coaching, you know? So <laughs> is, this, is, is this something that was posted in 2017? Would you actually agree with this, you know? Yeah, I agree with that. That's all true. Everything that guy said was true. Um, I think he was paraphrasing me, um, things that I had said in probably 2010, um, people always bring up the number of players that go to the world series of poker, yeah. Why the world series, that metric? that's a, the, the worst metric you can possibly imagine because the world series of poker has nothing to do with playing poker. It has nothing to do with making a living playing poker. Nobody makes a living playing poker tournaments. Poker tournaments, it's impossible to make a living playing live poker tournaments. It is a pipe dream. It's basically just like buying a lottery ticket. Um, I can prove this mathematically very easy. Many people have proven it mathematically before. If you have a 30% ROI, it puts you a, in these live tournaments. It puts you in the fucking top one-tenth of 1% 1 of all players and you still can't make a living with a 30% ROI. All you have to do is do the math of how much 30% ROI pays on an average tournament buy-in of $1,000, say, and how many hours you have to put in. It ends up being basically McDonald's wages. Um, what the World Series of Poker is, the World Series of Poker is, a, is an event. The World Series of Poker is a festival. The World Series of Poker is like Burning Man or the World Series of Poker is like the Kentucky Derby. It does not represent the popularity of any of going out and breathing dust every the other 364 days a year. The Kentucky Derby does not represent the popularity of horse racing the other 364 days a year. For that one day, it is the biggest event in the entire world or for that one week, for depending on how long the festival goes for, it's the biggest event in the entire world. 
But after that festival is over, nobody, it, it doesn't actually have any bearing on what goes on the other, the rest of the year. The rest of the year, the cash game poker and the tournament poker around the United States is bleak. Cash game poker is always bleak. But for the, the one shining moment, you get a big tournament where a bunch of people show up. It looks like this is that poker is doing great. But not, but, a, but the World Series of Poker doesn't do anything for a professional poker player. For a guy who makes a living 365 days a year playing cash game poker, which is the only way that you can make a living in poker, the World Series of Poker does nothing for us. It actually makes our lives worse. It used to be, at one point in time, people thought that tournaments brought players into poker that would then lose money in cash games. And that was true maybe 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. Yeah, I remember but then Joe that, Kada online, you know, he won the World Series of Poker. Suddenly he's in the 100, 200 online, losing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Is that not the case anymore now? Uh, maybe, the, yeah, but this is like a one-off thing. Even then, it's not, that's not enough money to like keep the ecosystem going. No, they realize yeah. they're losers very quickly. Very quickly. And they've already drawn all this money out of the poker economy. So like, let me explain something about the poker economy. The way that cash games are set up, nobody can ever win enough money to buy anything okay so like the way a cash game is set up if you're a recreational player or if you're a fish or even if you're you know like just a hobbyist if you have a really good night you win like maybe two buy-ins if you have the best night of your life you might win like four buy-ins no no no, no two buy-ins or four buy-ins on the best night of your life that's never enough money to, to buy anything. You might get one steak dinner. You might go to one strip club, something like this. You can't really, you're, you're not, you don't, what you, the amount of money that you've won all comes back into the poker game. A hundred percent of it comes back to me. Like if I see a guy, a fish win three buy-ins, I know a hundred percent of it's coming back to me. There's nothing. All it does is extend the amount of time that he's going to come to the casino. Yeah. But if a fish wins first place in a tournament with a $350,000 first prize or a $100,000 first prize or a million dollar first prize, tons of money's leaving the poker economy. Tons. Because now that fish has gotten real money that they're going to buy real things with. They're going to pay off their house. They're going to, their wife is going to take some of the money. It's at the kids college, uh, they're going to buy some buy some big ticket items. All that money is going to get moved out of the poker economy. So what these tournaments do with these very steep prize pools and basically with a jackpot at the top, the top is basically like a lottery jackpot, is they remove in one huge chunk a ton of money out of the poker economy. And all of that money doesn't come back. Whereas... In a cash game, basically 100% of the money comes back. Nobody ever wins enough to not come back and lose it back the next day. Like, if you win $100,000 getting first place in a tournament, it's impossible to come back the next day and lose it. But if you win, if you have the best day of your life in a cash game as a fish, and you win four buy-ins, you can come back the next day and lose that back instantly. So all of the money in a cash game, the way a cash game is set up, siphons the money from the fish to professional poker players. But the way that tournaments are set up, the money goes to a, basically a random person who gets first place and is then swept out of the poker economy. Because even though there are much better tournament players and much worse tournament players, it when you look at the people who get exactly first place, it's just pretty fucking random. Whereas if you look at over a one year's period of time in a cash game, who has all the money, it's never random. Never. It's always best player. 
Yeah, I, th I think yeah, there is actually a trend, you know, back in the day, uh, I think the trend is starting where the, the recreational players and being a serious hobbyist, as you say, uh, even I, I spoke to the CEO of World Poker Tour and he told me, listen, we're, we're not really all about the poker player. I mean, we're not about poker. Poker for us are talent. We are a TV show. We are a festival. You know, we're trying to make money this way. It's not necessarily about showing grinders, but it's for us people having fun, people showing stories. So, yeah, it's not about the professionals. One thing you right. mentioned, though, because you were a tournament purist, <laughs> you mentioned that you regretted that you didn't play them when there was this televised tournament when they started and there was this massive exposure to all the players, you know. So um, do you regret really that you didn't play the tournaments, you didn't uh, cut the cards, with the, uh, the bananas with the cards, you know? Uh, and the question, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was Chris Ferguson, by the way. You didn't know the name, but yeah. it, was, it was Chris Ferguson, guys, look it up. Uh, isn't this era kind of similar though? Is when YouTube comes, Twitter, people aren't outspoken like you, Lyman, you know, they, they don't get exposure by fighting back the trolls and having all this knowledge. But uh, uh, haven't tournaments become exactly what you said, like back in the uh, when they were starting? Aren't all these like influencers and YouTubers playing these tournaments to try to, uh, in metaphorical way, cut those bananas with the cards? Isn't that basically the, the way people can actually make money, you know, to go on the tournaments, try to get some exposure? Then get views on YouTube, you know. Yeah, that seems like that's the path. Uh, it's a lot more work than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Like, it used to be that if you were a fishy player, but you binked a tournament, like say 2004, if you were a fucking Chris Moneymaker or Mike Matisau or one of these guys, you had some personality, uh, and you bink, bink a tournament, even if you were a fishy player, the the sponsors will just pour money on you um, if you had personality. So you would get a sponsorship deal with an online poker site. Like you could be like Mike Sexton. Mike Sexton is a friend of mine, golf with him, but he's a fishy poker player. But if you, if you, you, if you had a personality, then same thing with all those guys. Most of those guys, they're, they're gone. You don't see any of those guys around anymore. They weren't actually good, great poker players. Most of them just had a great personality and they could get sponsorship deals, sponsorship deals with online poker sites, online poker sites rake millions and millions of dollars. So these sponsorship deals paid millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, fucking, I don't even remember, like any Duke, Howard letter. Who the fuck are, where are these fucking people? You know, <laughs> uh, fucking, um, I, I mean, I, if I if you go back and look at the list of names, it's like Men the Master, fucking Scotty. They, they all had good. They had good stories and they had a good personality, but they couldn't. They weren't fucking like crushing poker players. They were fish. People wanted them in the games. Um. So then, it wasn't that much. If you beat a tournament and you had a good personality and you could create a character for yourself. The money would just roll in. Like the best person that this ever is probably Daniel Negreanu, mm -hmm. who has who has become a great poker player, um, in in a lot of ways. And Phil Helmuth, he's the other one. Those Phil Helmuth and Daniel Negreanu are like the two guys that have like stood the test of time, right. like just like always knowing how to keep more money pouring in, more money pouring in, more money pouring in. Uh, yeah, using they get all the oh. flag though, right? From the online pros, they get all the flag. But uh, in retrospect, when I listened to you talk, they knew what the hell was going on, right? They know how to stay in the game and, and make the real money. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, Helmuth and Negreanu had to be the two smartest people as far as marketing themselves during the poker boom. Like, they were the ones who saw where the real money was coming from in these online poker sites. Like they did the, I think, cause like Ivy was a much better poker player, but he never marketed himself in that way. Um, they, they were like the master marketers and they ended up with the most money. Well, other than, than, than the guys who started or players who started their own site, like Her, Chris Ferguson and Howard Letter and <laughs> what that was, you know, uh, so like, that's where the real money came in then. It wasn't, I don't think it was that much work then. Now it's a lot of hard work. Like, you have to bank a tournament. 
you have to start a YouTube channel and then you have to put out content like every day. I think these guys that are really working it for the good for, for good money, like I guess you say like Brad, there's a guy named Brad. Brad um, yeah, and there's a guy, um, Andrew Neem, mm -hmm. who's, a, who's a sharp guy. I think that they work really hard. They seem like they work really hard. Like they have to put out so much content yeah, and yeah. edit. Editing takes Is, time. They have to learn, improve, study algorithms today, study other creators. Unless, well, yeah. Brett was one of the first ones. Brett, Brett really, he came in, he built the audience. He's a really, he doesn't really care much as much about the uh, content making. He's really there for the poker. So he, he might be a bit of an outlier. But yeah, if, if you want to start today, it, it's, it's a lot of work. It's hiring editors, you know, <laughs> PA and social yeah. media people yeah, and stuff like that, right? When I see these guys' videos now, like if I'm clicking around and I see a video, like there's this guy that was recently uh, on Live at the Bike, or it's Live at the Commerce now, and I did the commentary, so I wanted to like see like what he was all about. His name's Wolfgang Poker. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. This guy looks like he puts a lot of work into these things. There's graphics and sounds, and it's almost like he's running his own little TV show, you know? So it's it's a it's a lot different than it used to be, where you just like basically like put on a funny hat and and <laughs> made a lot of noise at a poker tournament, and if you took first place, you got a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he makes shorts. It, he puts out 10, 10 to thirty second shorts, but it takes about four hours to edit one, think about everything. So you're a little bit of your TV show, you know, right, Ly Lyman? Um, so if People want to make money, of course, I guess banking a tournament, trying to make it is one way. What else can people actually do to make poker a worthwhile pursuit today, you know, if it's not only playing poker, besides trying to get this sponsorship and uh, YouTube money, you know? Well, you could be like sort of a hot chick and then you can meet a guy named Nick Airball. <laughs> you can have him loan you $100,000 to play on a stream, and then you can felt Garrett Adelstein with Jack 4. That would do it. <laughs> can, we, can I ask you about this? Because you said uh, you said 80... By the way, the Jack 4 hand, uh, I can put it in the, uh, in the podcast later. Uh, you said 85% not cheating because it was just so dumb, and this is what like happens usually. <laughs> right. Can you explain a little bit about that? And I know you all about, you, you've been a host, you, you've been a prop and stuff like that. Can you talk about uh, Garrett's reaction? Uh, how come he got away with it? And, you know, why it wasn't cheating? Why why, why you really think it wasn't 85%? Well, I've been around cheaters and gambling. Like, basically, like... Um, Professional criminals, con artists, this or that, uh, gambling cheats, they don't operate the way that that hand went down, and they never would. Nobody would operate that way. Because you have to understand something. <clears throat> to set up that situation, to set up a situation where you know the whole cards, uh, of, of your opponent um, is a massive amount of work. It's a massive amount of training and practice and there's a massive amount of setup that would have to go into it. Uh, whether you are using an inside man or an RFID sniffer or a Mark Deck, this is like... <clears throat> a military type operation to put hundreds of thousands of dollars in play and set up this big score, this big hit. Okay. Uh, you don't go to all this trouble on in a situation where you're behind and then you run it twice and then you give the money back. That's never happened in the history of cheating. It never would happen in the history of cheating. 
it's not the way any cheating team would ever operate to put in all this time and all this energy and all this money at risk for a coin flip and then give the money back. It does not exist. It's beyond the realm of, of logic or of anything that happened in a real world amongst criminals. But something that happens all the time, every single day, is people getting way over their head in a poker game and letting their, their emotions get the best of them and doing something incredibly stupid, like mind-bogglingly stupid. I was playing poker today. I was playing in a 10 20 no limit game today. One guy bets on the end, and I, I have a, an over, I had top pair the whole way, and then an over card came to the top pair, and the guy led into me, and I was tanking, and I, I grabbed my chips to possibly call and he just turns over his hand and he says, he says, you got me. <laughs> I, I was, I, 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 I have nothing. I hadn't even moved my chips yet. I was like, buddy, I didn't even move my chips yet. Yes. I was probably going to call you, but look, <laughs> yes, I have you. And he's like, Oh shit. I thought for sure you had called. He just got so nervous <laughs> Because he was bluffing in a situation where he hadn't bluffed before. He just got so nervous that I had called him and he was so embarrassed by the fact that I was going, I hadn't called him yet. He got so nervous that I was going to call him and he was already so pre embarrassed by the fact that his play hadn't worked that he just turned over his hand out of turn and said, you got me. If this happened on a stream, it would seem batshit insane and the chat would go wild. But this type of stuff happens in a casino a lot. Okay? That was one hand from today. Also from today. Same fucking game. There's like a fishy player limps to 20. Another fishy player limps 80. I make it 100 with pocket queens and an, an old like Korean guy makes it 2,000, his entire stack, 2,000 out of the big blind. The other two players fold. It's on me. I have queens. It's a very strange play for me to make it 100 and then the guy to make it 2,000. But I'm still not going to fold queens. So I, I just call it 2,000. I, I never, I, ne I never, I, the way that I play poker, I always turn over my hand immediately. Mm -hmm. Instantly. I always turn over my hand instantly. <laughs> so I turn over the queens instantly. The board runs out. The old Korean guy says, well, let's see what I have. He turns, he, he says, I didn't look. He turns over one card and it's just like a nine. He turns over the other card and it's a three. He fucking loses his entire fucking stack. And he says, I thought for sure you were going to fold. That was it. That was a whole hand. If this happens on a stream, then people are going to be like, what the fuck is going on? What's going on? What is this collusion? Blah, 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 blah. Is, there ch is this chip dumping or something? You know, like just chat would go wild. But this is just stuff that happens in a poker game. The old guy had decided that when I made it a hundred, for some reason I was bluffing. And he had decided that if he put in $2,000 without even looking at his cards, he was going to pick up the $100. How he decided this, I don't fucking know. What was going through his head, I will never know. But he did it. And why did the other guy turn over a bluff out of turn? I don't know. I will never know. Why did fucking Robbie move all with Jack for? I don't know. We'll never know. It's because fishy players in stressful situations do stupid shit. Criminals with six figures on the line do not do stupid shit ever. They practice, they're prepared, they make their, they pick their mark, they make their score and they're out. 
So I gave it 85-15. I could probably have given it 95-5, but there was no cheating in that hand. Uh, so obviously people were... Uh... Was she just embarrassed? Why do you think she gave the money back? And how would you rate Garrett's reaction after? She gave the money back because she didn't come on that show to win money. She came on the show to be famous. It wasn't even her money. The money was a loan. It's easy to give back money that's not yours, number one. It's easy to give back money when you weren't there for the money, number two. She got dragged into a hallway and her dreams of becoming a famous poker per personality looked like they were about to get flushed down the drain. She's figured her quickest way out of that and to be a hero again is just to give the money back and keep playing and basically pretend like nothing happened. If you think that's a crazy thing to do, then you just don't know anything about human psychology. That shit happens all the time, all over the world. There's a, a crime happens. They say, say the crime was committed by a guy from Czechoslovakia with a little top knot on the top of his head. And then the police come and they look and they find you and they say, did you commit this crime? You say, no, no, I didn't commit this crime. And they say, listen, you're going to jail for the rest of your life. You might even get the death penalty. If you don't just admit to it right now, but if you admit to it, we'll let you go and we'll be on our way. If you admit to it, it will go right in the system. You will get the benefit of the doubt because you're a good, you're an honest person. But if you lie, and we find out later that you lied, it's over. And guess what? People, people confess to crimes that they didn't do all over the world every day. And then when the DNA evidence comes out, the person never did it. They were just pressured. They were in a pressure situation. They made a stupid decision. Okay. People in pressure situations make stupid decisions all the time. Some people just can't handle pressure. Robbie is also is obviously somebody who cannot handle pressure. In the Jack Four with the hand, she made a massive error because she was in a pressure situation and she couldn't handle it. When she's in the hallway and she has Feldman and whoever else in the hallway pressuring her, she couldn't handle the pressure. She cracked under the pressure. But in, all, in, in both of those instances, her overall arching goal, if your overall arching goal is to be a YouTube famous poker player, she made the perfect play. Act like a spaz on a stream. Don't get thrown off the stream. Those are the two rules. Be popular on the stream. Don't get thrown off the stream. So in her mind, she was doing, and her goals are all aligned. All of her uh, incentives are aligned for the decisions that she made. Garrett felt that he, Garrett knew certain things. This is my guess. This is my guess. Garrett knew that her and Nick Airball and that cowboy boyfriend guy were in on something. Nick had loaned the guy money. The guy had loaned Nick his watch or something. There's a huge backstory. They're all playing on a stake, yada, yada, yada. Garrett knew some something that things were already sort of fishy, that it was a fishy combination of people, okay? Like, not a, sort of seedy characters. These sort of seem like seedy characters. That's number one. Number two, Garrett also is very detailed in how that he prepares for these poker games. Um, he watches the videos of the people who are going to be that he allows to be on stream with him. So if he allows you to be on stream with him and you've played in other televised games, he goes over this shit like game film, like a basketball team or a football team. He goes over this shit like the fucking Zapruder film. Okay. So Garrett doesn't come into these things cold. So when Garrett saw the situation with the way that Robbie played her hand, he knew that he, that she didn't have anything. He had already watched her on other streams or, or played a live cash game with her. He already knew that he had her. When she ends up making this fucking spazzy play and then ends up winning the hand, a lot of 
things come rushing into his head that have to do with being on tilt, that have to do with being incredibly embarrassed. So he's on tilt. He's incredibly embarrassed. He knows he's surrounded by shady people. And he knows that something just went horribly wrong. And things just got blurted out that probably shouldn't have been blurted out if he had the time to think about it. And here's the easy way to prove that. If they would have ran it twice and he would have won both runs, he would have never accused her of cheating. Okay? If they would have run it twice and he, and they would have chopped the pot, he would have never accused her of cheating. It's only because he lost both runs. It's only because he lost both runs. And when he lists, when he loses both runs, it's just so painful. It's so tilting. It's so bizarre that even a dude that has played that many hands was caught off guard by his own emotions and he let his emotions get the best of him. That's my feeling on the situation. I think if he had to do it over again, he would not do that. That is my, that's my guess. Yeah. Uh, you know, this really ties well into poker advice because um, on poker sesh, by the way, it's so weird to see you. Uh, I wished all your poker sesh highlights on YouTube. You can guys, you guys can find them. You don't have a cigar. You don't do the mukbang with the whiskey today. But uh, yeah, one thing that you actually mentioned, it really ties into this nicely. When you are in a river decision and it's much bigger than what the people usually play, right? It's 1020 and it's a 5,000 river bluff. Logic doesn't play anymore, right? People basically go into this fight or flight response and right. uh, you have to see, okay, are, uh, are they the person that usually call? Are they the p person that usually fold in these situations when cornered? Uh, so I guess this was exactly the same, you know, that she, she wasn't comfortable, she <laughs> made a spazzy play and then, uh, you know, just had to somehow justify it, I suppose. Exactly. That's right. Right, so let's get into poker advice. You know, obviously, um, I'm, I'm one of those uh, Euro trash regs as well, you know. So, um, what advice? Hey, listen, hey, hey, <laughs> Lemon, listen to me. I love Euro poker players uh -huh. in Europe. In Europe. <laughs> right. yeah. And if I ever come to Europe, uh -huh. then I'm a shit reg American. Uh -huh. and you guys can rag on me all you want because I don't belong there taking up, clogging up space in your game. I don't belong there taking mo taking money from your fucking neighbors and your regulars. You guys can get on my case as much as you want. But when you guys come to America, then I get to get on your case. <laughs> I can tell you from experience, I've done an interview as well. The, the scene in the U.S. that you explained that, you know, the, the public poker games are actually much smaller than the private ones. Well, it's the same in here. And not many people know about this, you know, um, if you get invited to one of the private games with football players you have complete fish you play for much higher stakes of course you can get stiff on, on the finger you know so um, you say just playing in public games is not great how can people uh, get to play in this all the rage in poker right now how can they get to private games how can they uh, get into hosting that you do and basically to get more uh, income than what you said is not great which is just playing in, in a public casino so what advice would you get people euro rex if they stay in europe there's a possibility for these games as well what would you tell them uh, what advice would you give us to be good sports and how to get into these games and how to start maybe uh, hosting or being a pro? Well, I mean, uh, y yeah, you can play in a, pri it's easy to play in a private game. The private game host almost always needs bodies. Uh, as long as you're not like a total stiff, if you're a total stiff, he still will let you in the game sometimes. But he's only going to let you in the game when the game's horrible and he needs bodies. When the game's great, you're never you're not going to get an invite. Um, but even if you get the invite, it's usually not worth playing in these games unless the host will make some kind of deal with you because the rake is so high, you can't beat the rake. Like, in the United States... And I assume it's the same in Europe. The rake on these private games is approximately four big blinds of hand. So if you're playing in a game with like, you know, some sort of Saudi Arabian sheik 
and a guy from an NBA and a famous actress or whatever, and you guys are playing 100, 200, no limit, they're going to rake $800 a hand, a hand. Yeah. So this is unbeatable. Uh, no matter how bad the players are, it really is unbeatable. And the reason that they can get away with a rake like that is because they're providing a penthouse and a private chef and 10 out of 10 massage girls slash hookers, um, credit line, million dollar credit line on the finger, this and that. You're paying for all that extra stuff when you're paying that $800 a hand rate. But as a poker professional, you don't really give a shit about that extra stuff. You just want to win in the poker game. So you're not using the freebies and you're paying the rake. It's just unbeatable situation. Now you could come and use all the freebies, but now you're just another degenerate. <laughs> um, you're just going to end up broken in the gutter, you know, uh, after those poker host girls get done with you. So, uh, you want to be the guy running the game, obviously. Um, it's easier. You can run a private game in a live scenario, or you can run a private game in an app or what most of them do is they run both. Most live private games have an app game too, so that the, the guy can, can sort of keep tabs and, and get rake from these players all the time, 24 hours a day. Uh, the host cam, he keeps all of his fish in one spot when they're playing online or when they're playing live. Uh, this isn't just like something you go do. This is an in, insanely hard job. Like to be a private game host is, you know, like rock. It really is sort of like rocket science. Um, it's the equivalent because you have to be the type of person that number one networks very well, meets lots of people, and is able to convince these people to like come and gamble with you. Uh, you have to extend these people credit lines and you have to be able to collect those credit lines. Um, you have to play in the game and give action, but not so much that you lose all your money back. You have to deal with other private game hosts that are trying to poach your players or trying to cause you trouble. You have to deal with the food and the booze and the drugs and the bookmaking and the girls. You have to deal with the getting them, uh, laundering the money, <laughs> whatever. It's a, it's a tough right. gig. Mm -hmm. You have to be a young guy with a lot of energy who's willing to work basically 24 hours a day. Um, and if you do a good job, you'll make a million dollars. Sure. Uh, but I would say 90% of the people who try it end up going broke. Only 10% make that million dollars because they're sort of like, you know, Tony Montana or something. They really, really, really know what they're doing in that underworld situation. They really, really, really deal with people exceptionally well. They know how to like cut somebody off without making the person mad they know how to take just the right amount of money from everybody and keep them coming back. Uh, they know how to deal with the other underworld characters that they have to deal with. It's a uh, massive pain in the ass, really. But if you have no other options uh, and you're really good at it, I suppose you'll figure it out. Running a game in a casino is completely different mm -hmm. because then it's totally legal. You make a lot less money but you don't have to deal with all that side stuff. Uh, but you just have, you have to deal with casino management, which is its own special problem because they, they're your partners now and your, and your incentives aren't always aligned. How does that they're, actually work? You know, you, you said that you don't even play poker unless someone pays you to play. Uh, that's right how, how exactly does this work because you know for a lot of people listening to this they're like wait, wait what do you mean why would they pay me to play poker you know well if if you live in some place like los angeles or maybe in some parts of texas san francisco some parts of oregon um 
There might be other places. I don't know about Europe. Uh, you have card rooms. Card rooms basically only spread poker. They might spread a couple other things, but they're not allowed to have like roulette or craps. They're not allowed to have slot machines. Okay. They're not. So these are, these are poker rooms. So when you have a bunch of poker rooms in an area, it's very important for the casino owner to spread poker games because that's how he makes all his money. If you have a, a real casino with slot machines and roulette and craps tables, you don't give a shit whether anyone plays poker. You'd rather have them play something else. The worst thing that can happen to you if you run a real casino is having somebody come in and play poker. That's like a disaster. The second biggest disaster is having them come in and bet sports. Second, the, what you want is having them come in and play table games and slots. Okay? So if you run a real casino, you're not going to spend any money for a poker host or a poker prop player. Okay? Because you don't give a fuck about the poker room. It's like, just, yes, come in, play poker, but please go outside and play something else as quickly as possible. But if you live in a city where there's rooms that are where you can only play poker, now it becomes very important to have poker games running, okay? So, there's two poker rooms, let's say, on different sides of the street. There's, they can be a mile apart or whatever. Poker players get up in the morning. They look on the poker website to see what games are running. And then by seeing what games are running, they decide which poker room to go to. So if your poker room can have games running in the morning and games running at different stakes and different types of games, the players are going to come to your poker room and not to the other poker room. Because there's nothing worse for a poker player in the entire world than driving to the casino and getting there and there's no game. So the casino will pay a guy like me to play poker at their poker room because I have a very special set of skills. Number one, I have hundreds and hundreds of phone numbers of other poker players that I can call and text and say the game is going and come in and play cards with me. Number two, I hang out with high stakes poker players. And so when I'm hanging out at the golf course or out at dinners or something, then I can bring those poker players into the casino with me. And number three, I will play any game against any player any time. Okay? So if somebody wants to come to the casino and they want to play draw, I'll play draw with them. If they want to play stud, I'll play stud with them. If they want to play Omaha, I'll play Omaha with them. If they want to play Hold'em, I'll play Hold'em. If they want to play high stakes, I'll play high stakes. Okay? So having a guy like me around is very valuable to the casino because when a customer comes in, they're always going to have a game because they can just say, oh, hey, Abe, Mo and Ali just showed up and they want to play stud. And I'll say, sure, let's play stud. Or, you know... <coughs> Sammy and and uh, and Chen just showed up and they want to play triple draw. I'll say, yeah, let's play triple draw. Um, and so when these people show up at a casino, they don't have to worry about there not being a game because there's a couple guys getting paid by the casino, me and a few other guys, who will sit and play. And it makes it so that like they never walk in, have no game, get mad, and then go to another casino. They always walk in and have a game. So most of the time when people walk in, they want to play Hold'em, Limit Hold'em, No Limit Hold'em, Omaha. So that's what I spend most of my time playing. Mostly Omaha. Right, so there you go. Uh, what, what, what are banked house games? What does that mean, by the way? I don't think many people know about that. 
Well, it, when you play in a card room, the way that these card rooms are legal is that there's no gambling in the card room with the card room. So, like, when you go to Las Vegas and you play blackjack, you play against the house. You play against the owner of the casino, basically. Mm -hmm. But when you come to Los Angeles and play blackjack, you play against the other players at the table. The owner of the casino isn't allowed to win any money. Ah. The owner of the casino just charges you rent to sit at the table. 1% of whatever your bet is. So somebody needs to pay the winners. And that person is the person at the table with the most money will say, I'll be the house. I'll be the bank. So the person plays their hand of blackjack. And when they win, the casino doesn't give them any money because the casino is not allowed to play against them. When they win, you give them the money. But, but when they lose, you get their money, okay? So you make yourself the casino, basically. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, this is very lucrative. There you, a lot, there's a lot of money to be made doing this because obviously most people lose. So what happens is, one rich guy hires like, let's say a casino has 20 tables. One rich guy hires 20 people to sit at all 20 tables and bank the tables. He pays them an hourly rate, but he play, but those people play with his money. And then all the money that they win over the day goes back to him. Okay. This is called professional bankers. Mm -hmm. And this is called what's called a corporation, a professional banking corporation. And every one of these casinos, these card rooms, has a professional banking corporation in it. Awesome. Well, yeah, I don't think many people know about this. Thanks so much for shedding light on this. Right. Uh, before we end, we go, we've been going for a long time. Let's run through some names. Uh, Grimstar is asking about Black Gary. Do you remember Black Gary? Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's certain people that hang around casinos always asking people for money, you know? Oh, oh yeah. I, I, yeah. It doesn't really happen in Europe that much. It's it's, that, it's not really a part of the culture. Well, uh, they just hang around and they hope that the winners just throw them some cash. How does that work? Yeah, they're called rail birds. Uh -huh. They beg people for money or they beg people to put them in tournament. And then you put them in the tournament and then if they win, they give you, you split it 50-50. Uh -huh. It's not a profitable situation. It's a horrible situation. But... There are these guys like Black Gary, the legendary Railbirds, Eskimo Clark. I don't want to, I mean, everybody knows who these guys are. Sam Grizzle. They, I think they're dead now. Uh, <clears throat> um, I'm not going to say the names of most people who are alive. Yeah. Because these are actually pretty dangerous people too. I mean, they're basically sort of like aggressive panhandlers. Uh -huh. Um. But they're, they're just like legendary, like when every now and then they do bink a tournament, right? And they owe so many people money that when they go to the cage to cash out, there'll be like a line of like 20 people behind them. All the people they owe, they owe money to. <laughs> <laughs> One time I put this guy, Black Gary, in a tournament. I was just telling you it's a horrible thing to do, but I sort of had to. Um. Uh, there's certain type of people at the casino, a car, the card rooms that in Los Angeles, there's a very special culture, gambling culture in Los Angeles because of all the, um, different minorities that come from around the world. Um, if there's, there's just like very, very strange mix and like, there's certain cultural things <coughs> about some of the gamblers. So there's a type of person in Los Angeles, a type of gambler that um, always plays with every dollar they have. Okay. 
So if they have $10,000, they buy into a poker game with $10,000 buy-in. And if they have $20, they buy into a poker game with $20 buy-in. Uh, they don't give a fuck. Like, it's all on the table all the time. So because of that, they're usually broke. But every now and then when one of them goes on a run, it's an epic run. Because they just go bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's this guy, Black Gary, he had gone on this pretty epic run. And he had a lot of money at one point. And I was hosting a pot limit Omaha game at Bicycle Club. And I knew that if he would, I was having trouble getting the game started. I knew if he would play poker with me, the game would fill instantly. So I said, Gary, come on, play PLO with me. He said, no, I don't want to play PLO, but I'll play deuces seven triple draw. I said, okay, let's play half deuces seven triple draw, half PLO. He said, okay. Um, on one condition, he says, he says, you have to put me in today's tournament. It was one of those tournaments that had like 20 day ones. It was like a, oh, okay, okay. it was like a $550 buy-in. So I'm like, fuck it was, I make a, I'm making, I know I'm going to crush him in it when we're pay, playing heads up. Number one, number two, I know he's going to fill the game. I make a lot of money on a rake. So it was worth it to me. So we start playing heads up and of course it's horrible. And everybody sees now that he's sitting deep. And so then the game fills up. Um, and once the game fills up, he says, okay, I'll give me the 550 so I can go play the tournament. I said, okay. So I give him the 550 so he go play the tournament. Fully figuring that I just flushed this money down the drain, right? So the, the, these things with all these day ones, they take forever. Yeah. So like, it literally, it's like three days later, he's made the final table. Okay. So I'm like, oh shit, I'm going to make some decent money. Like, first place was probably like, these things are so steep. I want to say first place is like $250,000 or something. But ninth place is like $9,000 because it's like so steep, you know? Um, so he's at the final table and I'm sitting there. I'm like, God, my, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to leave a casino no fucking chance until he busts or wins because otherwise I will not get my money. Impossible. Cause so many people are going to be lining up to get their money. So, um, a few, like 45 minutes goes by and I see him wandering out of the tournament area down the hallway. Like where my pot limit Omaha game was, there was a window so I could see what was going, people walking by. So I see him walking by. I'm like, oh shit, he busted. I gotta go over there. We gotta go so we so when he catches out, I get half my money. So I say, Oh, Gary, you bust? He's like, No, no, I didn't bust. I'm like, what? You don't break already? It's only been like 45 minutes. He says, No, no, I'm sitting out unlucky dealer. <laughs> <laughs> he set out he set out the entire down of a dealer at a final table and just got blinded off. Because he said, if I play with this dealer, I'm going to get busted 100%. So he's, but then it, he got busted anyway, fucking dipshit. He ended up, he, but he ended up cashing for like almost $10,000. We chop it up. So it all worked out for me, but it, that just shows like what you're dealing with sometimes with the LA Railbirds. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, speaking of, let's run through some names. Uh, Tom Dwan. Um Rumor has it that he was play, playing private games in China and he, he dug himself into a hole. You were saying there was something unethical with side bets. Can you shed a little bit of light into the whole situation with the Tom Duan and the dead from your perspective? Oh, I mean, I only know what everyone else knows. He made that deal with, uh, with Jungle Man and he stiffed him. And Jungle Man played it pretty smart by staying, trying to stay his friend so that money keep trickling in. So Jungle Man got money kept trickling in. He stiffed Haralabob. He stiffed, I don't know, he stiffed several people. They, I, they try to stay nice with him so the money keeps trickling in, but at some point, if the money doesn't keep trickling in, 
these these uh these things come to light it just sort of seems like Tom Dwan just might have a gambling problem of some sort. Uh, he never looks good. He always looks like he's been up for five days straight, but who knows? I don't look that good either, and I get lots of sleep. Um, he uh, he was playing in those in this. If you play in these Chinese private games, you have to have a Chinese sponsor. This is what high stakes players who play in these Chinese private games in Macau have told me they told the, I know a high stakes player. He went to Macau to play. He has, you can't just like be a white guy and walk in and play. You have to have a Chinese sponsor. So basically you're just like an avatar or a puppet for some really rich Chinese guy. You're like a, a horse for him, you know? Yeah. Um, so Duan supposedly was a horse for this, for one of those really rich Chinese guys, Paul Pua. And, you know, when you're a horse, you get half the winnings, but then on the losses, you're probably going to make up or what have you. And if we, once you're in makeup, like, I suppose if you stop being the person's horse, then they can say that you owe them the money. That's sort of a gray area. Because these things are always like handshake deals. They're never like written on a contract. So somebody might say that Dwan owes them $30 million because he lost th $30 million of their dollars in a cash game where he was basically playing as their their horse. Mm -hmm. Dwan would just say, I don't owe you that money. I was your horse. If I win money as your horse in the future, it just comes off that number. But I'm just not going to play for you anymore. <laughs> you know? Uh, I think that's you know that could be the way that you end up in a ditch somewhere. I don't know. It's all way above my pay grade. Right. So basically, this will happen. Uh, we talked about David Sklansky already. I know. I know. Graham Bonnie has to talk about it. Mason Malmuth. You know. I, I think you you were at two plus two even before he needed to sign up. You know. Obviously, he's a very outspoken guy. He's the guy that has been unbanning you. Now it's probably the, the other overlords that have done it and stuck a ball right. on, your, on your ass, you know. Can you talk about Mason a little bit and what he means to poker and you personally? Well, on my old show, Poker Sesh, I had Mason as a guest. It, I don't know where how to find those old shows because I don't own them and I don't put them online. This is all done by fans. I had, I had Mason as a guest once, and I had Sklansky as a guest once. They were both great shows, by the way. Great shows. Very weird. Weird fucking shit happened. They're both, they're both sort of like legends of poker, but also like very weird dudes. Um, but they, they are basically the originators of thinking about poker in a technical way. There was no such thing as thinking about poker in like this technical mathematical way before them, uh, at least not published. So they were the first, they were the trailblazers. Their books were always the best books. Um, I'm sure you see the way that they're treated on two plus two. Now they're, they're basically treated like criminals, which is sad. It just shows how horrible the cess, what a horrible cesspool two plus two is in a lot of ways. Um, I, I, I think that they're very, very, uh, weird and interesting dudes. I think that they are legends of poker and, um, I don't know if, if, if there's much more to say about it than that. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you guys for starting two plus two. Obviously we wouldn't be here without you. Uh, what do you think about Nick Airball? I think you said he actually runs a pretty good business. Many people, you know, there's so much controversy. Oh, he's a fish. He thinks he's a pro, but he isn't. Uh, what's your take on Nick? Um, I don't, I don't really have a take on him because I don't, I don't know anything about his private life or anything. I only know like the one or two hands people have sent me about. Oh, look at this this hand on the stream um, that he was in. Uh, he's definitely like he's into self promotion and 
he wants to be a poker celebrity and more power to him, I suppose. Whether he's a fish or 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 not doesn't really matter as long as he still has money. I mean, that's just sort of the way it works. As long as he still has money, he he is exactly who he says he is. Like, until somebody has, runs out of money in the gambling world, they are exactly who they say they are. You only become something other than what you say you are once you're out of money. Once you're out of money, then you then you become a real bird. Uh, then you become a broke loser. Like but as long as you still, <laughs> you know, but as long as you still have money, you're you are exactly who you say you are, and that's the way the gambling world works. Um, he made a big mistake getting hustled into that heads up match with Berkey. That was a big mistake. Berkey was hustled in real hard. Berkey was a pretty genius move by Berkey, who also gets a lot of hate. And I don't know exactly why, because that was some cold ass, like old school gambler fucking shit corralling Nick Airball into a match where he, he dumped him a million dollars. Uh, that's, uh, that deserves a lot of respect in my book. It doesn't matter whether Berkey was good at poker or not. He was good at the hustle. The hustle is the most important thing. Berkey has the million dollars. He is the one who did the hustling. The hustling is the most important part. He has the million dollars. So um, that's the extent of my knowledge on those situations. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. So yeah, uh, head, heads up to Berkey, you know, uh, Lyman obviously approves. Right, Lyman, so before, before we end this, um, you had such a long career, you know, I know that you're basically semi-retired, but what, what, what is next for you? Do you think you will get back on the Twitter streets, you know, and what do you do with your time besides those 15 hours per, per month or whatever week that you play poker? I, I mean, I'll go on any social media thing. I don't care. Uh, but I'm just never going to, like, do what they say, you know. If Twitter unbans me, I'll go right back and I'll just start doing the same shit I did before. Um, if some dude named Lemon with 121 describe, subscribers wants to talk to me for two hours, I'll talk to him. But I'm just going to say what I feel like saying. If 2 plus 2 wants me, I'm there. If they don't want me, I'm not there. I don't really take this stuff too seriously, you know, like people say like, oh, you're going to lose. If you say these things, you're going to lose your, your account. I don't give a fuck. They're not paying me. Nobody's paying me. I don't, I don't care if I lose a count where I'm not getting any money. They're lucky to have me there. That's my feeling. If they get rid of me, it's, it's their loss, not my loss. I got. Uh, there's a million free things I can be doing. I don't need to be doing free things for them. Um, so these uh, social media accounts, they come and go. One day one's here, one day it's gone. Another day another one's here, another day another one's gone. I don't give two shits. Uh, and, uh, in my free time, you know, I grow like psychedelic cactus. <laughs> what I grow is that? What is, what's a psychedelic cactus? Do you actually eat that book? Yeah. Like it's called, uh, you know, there's like Quachuma, peyote, different types of psychedelic cacti. I grow San Pedro. I do have different types of psychedelic cacti. Um, I grow fruits and vegetables, do a lot of cooking, um, play golf, a lot of golf. I gamble on uh, other things, different advantage plays that might pop up. And I, I will always probably play some small amount of poker, but whether I do or not, isn't super important to me anymore. Cause I don't, I don't need the money. I more play for like, the camaraderie or social club aspect of it. So if it's not fun and it's not like a social club aspect of it, then I'm not going to do it. I'm not just going to sit and grind poker. That's those days are long gone. One last thing, James Grimaldi, you've been in the chat, Grimstar, obviously. Uh, what advice would you give to Grimstar or anyone else that uh, wants to be as popular as you, you know, and have this big AMA on, on two plus two, what can he actually do? to uh, go, go ahead and have as many views as you do? Oh, I don't know. He's, 
He just has to answer every, every, the most important thing is to answer every single question and respond to every post. That's the most important thing. If you get, if you show respect to the people who took the time to try to talk to you, then they'll show respect back to you. So like anyone who takes the time to try to talk to me, just like you lemon, I give a, I, I try to, I try to be respectful and I try to give back and I try to have a good time. Uh, so if you, if somebody comes at me with positivity or curiosity, then they will get that back from me tenfold. But if somebody comes to me with negativity or snark or anger, then they're going to get that back from me tenfold. That's just the way it's going to be. And I think if you go about things in that way, everything will work out in the end. Yeah, so thank you so much, Slavin. Thank you so much for coming on. You know, it's been an absolute blast. Any final shout outs you have to our audience? Uh, it's going to be on the podcast, you know, on, on 2 Plus 2. Anything, uh, last words you want to say? Oh, I don't know. Everybody have fun. And if you see me at the casino, say hi. We'll have a beer. <laughs>